Good afternoon everybody, some guy here, and today we're going to be taking a look at Alienware's new Pascal powered notebook, the 15R3. Alienware is marketing this as the perfect balance of power and portability. Today we're going to be taking a look at just how powerful this machine is, and how well it handles games in the almost base configuration, rocking the Skylake Core i5. So before I get started, I get it, it's Alienware, we are all here to talk about games, but let's get some of the less important details out of the way first. Without good specs, you're gonna have a bad time. So let's go ahead and talk about what we're packing in this thing. Inside, you're gonna find a Skylake Core i5-6300HQ, running at 2.3GHz, with turbo boost to 3.2GHz. You will also find 8GB of DDR4 memory, running at 2133 MHz, a 128GB PCIe SSD boot drive with a 1TB 7200 RPM hard drive for storage. You will also find a 68 watt hour battery. Now that I've finished reading off the spec sheet, we're going to go ahead and move on to design and build. Now it has been said time and time again, Alienware is a gaming brand and the design clearly states its purpose by flaunting its subjectively over-the-top spaceship-type design, that is, until recent years. The new laptops, including the generation before these, featured a design which I personally did not find too over-the-top, and have been put together in a way that still makes it clear you own an Alienware device without doing too much. The new lighting system for this range of laptops helps make you stand out from the sea of dull and plain with its rather bright lights shooting out from the sides of the lid and the bottom of the chassis. It can be customized with 19 different color options, and there are also 20 if you count the choice to disable it in whatever area that you might have picked. The keyboard can be lit up in 5 different locations spread across. The colors can be displayed in 3 modes including Static, Morph, and Pulse. Everything from the color choices, locations, and even the tempo and duration of the lighting can be edited in the Alien FX screen of Alienware Command Center. Now let's talk about that bezel really fast. I have seen you all talking about it in the comment section of my impressions video. So yes, the bezel is pretty large in comparison to a lot of other laptops it competes against. I find this more of a subjective thing, however, as the bezel size does not bother me. I find that it balances out the rather muscular chunkiness of the entire laptop as a whole. According to Dell's website, this laptop is an entire inch thick and weighs 7.69 pounds. I don't actually have a scale available to get this information for you guys, but it, I can tell you, carrying it around the house, it sure doesn't feel like 7.69 pounds. That's pretty hefty, but I'm not sure. What's heavy to me might not be heavy to you, so I'd take this advice with a grain of salt. The keyboard is shifted to the right and has a set of programmable macro keys on the left which I have found to keep throwing me off every time I'm trying to do something in certain programs I might be trying to find a shortcut and a lot of shortcuts that I use involve the control key. Now naturally I'm going to be trying to reach over to that bottom left corner to find the control key and I end up hitting a macro key instead. It can get pretty annoying but as long as you're good to remember that there is macro keys this should not really be an issue with you but again if you're like me it's It'll bother you. The positioning of the WASD keys is also awfully close to the trackpad, so if you were trying to play a game like, let's say, Rise of the Tomb Raider on just the laptop, good luck doing that without having your left hand constantly triggering the palm rejection. But then again, nobody in the PC gaming community really uses a trackpad to play a game, so make sure you have that mouse ready, as always. When it comes to ports, I personally would have liked to have seen more than just two of them, which are USB Type-A. But with the way things are going nowadays, I could see why Dell decided to put two USB Type-C ports on here. As I've stated in my first impressions video, the body and the lid are pretty well built and solid. The lid does not move too much when it's propped up, so that's always a good thing. After what has been about 5 days now, maybe 4, I'm sorry, I, I forget the exact time, but the handrest area is actually pretty resistant to finger smudges as Dell claims it is. As you can see, if you look very closely, 
you can still get kind of a look at what happened, but for the most part, as long as you're regularly cleaning your device, you shouldn't have anything to worry about in the cleanliness department. Our next topic is going to be performance bits other than gaming. Now I want to get this out of the way first. A couple people have asked me if I was going to be testing the color gamut of the display. I haven't been able to find anywhere I could do that for free, so... I hate to tell you guys this, but I'm going to have to skip this portion of the review as I don't see a purpose in buying something I'm only going to use one time and never again. What I can tell you, however, is that the display has been a pleasure to play games on. It is surprisingly sharp and the colors are vibrant. I would like you all to know I'm saying this coming from a desktop setup, which uses two TN monitors, an ASUS ROG PG278Q for my main gaming, and an ASUS VG248QE which I use for day-to-day -day multitasking. So if you're aware of how color accurate those are, or might not be, um, from my eyes, the IPS 60Hz panel on the new Alienware 15 blows them out of the water with what appears to be a far greater color range. Do keep in mind too, the ASUS ROG PG278Q is not a cheap monitor, so I get that it's a TN panel and everything, but with a premium price, you should expect premium performance. Playing games on the 60Hz 1080p panel has not been too bad. There's some screen tearing which is to be expected on a display that doesn't have G-Sync, but your eyes eventually get used to it when you're without the luxury for a while. A fast-paced title like Overwatch was enjoyable on this screen in terms of responsiveness and reaction time. Multitasking with the Core i5 6300HQ has been pretty decent. It seems to reach near-max CPU utilization too quickly for my taste, but I am the type of person who likes having like 7 tabs open at once and sometimes streaming on top of that. Uh, with little to no hiccups from my main gaming rig, that's what I'm used to, so do keep that in mind. I would say if you were t the type of person that does a large amount of multitasking like that, I highly recommend that you step up to the i7-6700HQ rather than the i5, but if you are just going to be playing a game without too much going on in the background, then the Core i5 should be more than enough for you. I went ahead and I benchmarked the PCIe SSD using Crystal Disk Mark, and the 128GB SSD scored the following, and these are pretty good scores, not too bad at all. The 1TB 7200RPM mechanical drive scored the following, and that's what you should be expecting from a mechanical hard drive. The speakers are front facing and they're pretty clear. They pack a small punch of bass, which you will notice when playing games, more so than when you're listening to music. I've had a pretty good experience with not getting distortion from the audio when it ramps up, unlike my previous laptop, which would begin to crackle at around the 80% mark. The fact that they're front facing also helps them seem louder. I also enjoy the fact that you can hear where sounds are coming from a lot more easier. It gives you a more immersive experience than most other random laptop speakers. Well done to Alienware for making some pretty good laptop speakers, especially if you're not a really major bass addict. From my extremely unscientific test, uh, four full charges, I've been getting around three and a half hours to sometimes close to four and a half hours on just web browsing and streaming videos with about half brightness and Wi-Fi on. Uh, I wouldn't expect more than two hours of battery life if you intend on using this to play games, that is. Uh, if, if, if that is that critical to you, I highly suggest that you get the 99 watt hour battery instead. So now that we've gotten all that out of the way, we can finally talk gaming performance. So let's go ahead and get started with some easier titles here. Uh, we are going to have Resident Evil Revelations 2 playing here. Right now you see it, it's uh, running on battery right now, so you'll see that the uh, frames per second never goes over 30. If you look in the bottom left corner, you might have a hard time seeing it, but as you can maybe tell, it is running at a stable 30 frames per second on the battery using, uh, I believe it's Nvidia Optimus that's keeping it from going over 30 to help save battery life. Once you go ahead and get off of your battery and onto a stable power supply, you're going to be getting a pretty solid 60 frames per second on this title with pretty much no hiccups at all. Uh, I have it running on completely maxed out settings, so, yeah, you know, light title. Let's move on to something more uh, intense, though. Now, a couple of you have noticed my Overwatch kind of hanging out on my desktop of the impressions video. So, here is some Overwatch gameplay. Uh, 
the game is running on ultra settings right now, the ultra preset. I believe nothing has been changed. Uh, I can double check or annotate it in the video or description if need be. But yeah, as you can tell, it runs pretty good. It's usually in like the high 50s to 60 frames per second. I do have VSync disabled to see how high the frames can go, but for some reason I haven't been able to get it, get it to go over 60. Uh, I tried the different variable settings for the uh, frame limit. Variable, um, 60, and display based I believe the options were. And yeah, it doesn't go over 60 for some reason. Not sure if that's a glitch or whatnot. And speaking of glitches, I have no idea how this happened. I'm guessing it's the new GeForce Experience 3.0, which I've got to say I'm not a fan of, but uh, I've been able to accidentally get rid of the in-game UI a couple of times. Uh, I'm not really sure if it's due to the laptop, but I figured I'd point it out to you guys. After about 30 minutes of Overwatch, this is the CPU temperature range, and we also have the max temperature for the GPU but it usually sits from around 62 to 64 Celsius. Now if we take a look at Doom 2016, this is where things start to get a little weird. As you can tell in the top right corner, all the frames per second and the CPU GPU details, the frames per second jumps all over the place. I have no idea if this is a driver issue. We shall see if the upcoming drivers do anything to make this a lot more stable. Fan noise peaks at about 54 decibels. Now moving on to Rise of the Tomb Raider, we're just going to go ahead and boot up the benchmark, the in-game benchmark really fast and see what we get. And here's the results. I'm very curious to see what it looks like after the drivers come in though. Just like Doom, Rise of the Tomb Raider gets about 54 decibels to the highest noise level. Now let's go ahead and take a quick look at VR performance. The first title that we have here is going to be Lucky's Tale. I don't really have too much to say about this one because it's probably one of the easiest VR titles that you can run on your Oculus. Uh, it runs at about 85 to 90 frames per second looking at uh, the Shadow Play FPS counter. The next title that I have is a good bit more demanding than Lucky's Tale. It's going to be The Climb. So on the Core i5 model, you're not exactly going to be able to get 90 frames per second like most people would want, but uh, I am getting about 55 to 65 on the highest quality setting. It still doesn't look too bad and it's definitely 100% playable on this machine. In conclusion, I'd like to say that this laptop is pretty good, especially if you can get a really good discount on it like I did. I was able to get about, I think it was a 15% discount, so my configuration altogether was pretty good. I think I only got my laptop for 1300 shipped. That includes tax, so that was a pretty good price. I definitely want to say that the days where Alienware was the overpriced competitor is gone, because basically every other 10 series laptop that you find on the market, it's priced about the same. So you can't really say that Alienware is overpriced anymore. Do keep in mind if you want to be an early adopter that the NVIDIA drivers cannot be updated to the latest right now. Now this is due to change the next couple of weeks so I'll definitely be doing another video whenever that happens and show you guys just how much the performance has changed. I'm pretty sure it'll fix a lot of the, you know, very dramatic up and down in frame rate so definitely be on the lookout for that. Besides these rather big flaws, if you're looking for a laptop with a very gamer-eccentric design, look no further than the Alienware 15. Also, it boasts a really crazy cooling system, as you guys have seen in the temperatures. The GPU and CPU stay relatively cool compared to a lot of other devices that I've used. So with all that being said, guys, that pretty much sums up my first tech review. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed. And I tried to answer as many questions that you guys had. Uh, I don't exactly have all the equipment as you guys can see, but if uh, I really decide to take this seriously, maybe I can make the reviews a lot better. Uh, if you guys have any feedback or anything, feel free to leave a comment. And of course, if you guys enjoyed the video, please hit like. And if you didn't like it, go ahead and destroy that dislike button so you can angrily tell me that you didn't like the video. Alright, have a good one you guys.